Good morning. You guys didn't get the memo. You're supposed to sit on that side of the church today. <laughs> uh, if you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. Last week, I asked you a question. When you were a kid, did you ever get to bring a toy to church? And if you recall... In my parents' case, it didn't work out so well when they let me do that. This week, I want to ask you another question. Did you ever bring your favorite toy to school? Now, if you're my age or older, you probably thought show and tell, right? We had show and tell. Now it's probably illegal. It's probably a law against show and tell now. <laughs> But when I was a kid, and sometimes it would be like Fridays or something like that, you could wear like dungarees to school and bring your favorite toy. It was all good. And it was really all about showing off. It was like show off and tell. Maybe if you were a girl, you had an American Girl doll, the Ferrari of all dolls. Yes, I have a daughter I know about that stuff. I'd answered my front door with a pink headband on one time. It happens. Humiliating to be a father of a daughter. It's kind of about showing off. And I was thinking about it. At what age does that become silly? My wife was a middle school teacher for almost 10 years. And so she told me, the boys keep playing with toys longer than the girls. I said, yeah, boys never stop playing with toys. That doesn't happen. <laughs> but at what age, let's say you're a girl, does that look a little silly? Like a 12th grade girl coming in and showing her Barbies, like, this is Barbie, and this is Ken, <laughs> Barbie Ferrari. It'd be weird, wouldn't it? Not too cool. But at what point do we stop showing off, showing our toys to everyone and bragging about it? Does this continue until we're much older? We talked about not making much of ourselves last week in the context of leadership, church leadership. Don't try to be a rock star or a celebrity pastor, right? That was very important. Today, we'll look at how that applies, that concept, to everybody in the church, all of us as Christians. We're going to look at both sides of the religious coin this and next week. So these two messages kind of go together. So if there's a lot of people who are missing church, I guess school is out next week, so everyone's rushing out to travel. But I encourage you, go back, watch this message and if someone new comes in next week, encourage them to watch this message because it's kind of a both issue that we're going to be talking about here. So we're in Hebrews chapter 8. And I want to reach back a little, a little overview for you guys. The whole point of Hebrews is to say that Jesus is superior to everything essentially in the Old Testament. That's it. Jesus totally supersedes it. It's a sermon or a letter written to Jewish Christians, probably, and they might be thinking of going back to the law. In the beginning, before Roman persecution, the Jewish Christians were persecuted. We see this in Thessalonica. It happens 
there first, or in these contexts, first. Because, well, wait a minute, this is this new Jewish sect, you're saying Jesus is God? You can't say that, that's blasphemy. So they're getting persecuted, and so probably this is the situation there. And they're thinking, well, you know what? Forget Jesus. We're just going to go back to the law. It's easier. We won't get beaten up by our own people. So the author is saying Jesus is better than everything in the Old Testament, than the prophets, and the angels, than Moses, and Aaron, than Joseph, the high priests. He's better than that. Now we're going to see saying Jesus is better than the law. So we're going to talk about it a little bit today. Hebrews 7, let's just reach back into the last chapter, starting at verse 20. This new system was established with a solemn oath. Aaron's descendants became priests without such an oath, but there was an oath regarding Jesus. For God said to him, the Lord has taken an oath and will not break his vow. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus is the one who guarantees this better covenant with God. Today we're going to discuss a new and better covenant that we have with God through Jesus. So Hebrews chapter 8, no chapter numbers in the originals. So he continues about Jesus being the great high priest, the Old Testament system of worship being just a copy of what was to come in Jesus, just a shadow of what was to come in Jesus the real one in heaven. Hebrews 8, 6, but now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. For he is the one who mediates for us a far better covenant with God based on better promises. If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second to replace it. He then goes on to quote Jeremiah 31, pretty long quote, so I'm just going to kind of summarize for you. Jeremiah is a prophet in the Old Testament, comes in just before Judah falls to Babylon. So I told you in the past, you have that kind of civil war that they experience, the Israelites experience Israel in the north, Judah in the south, Israel falls first to Assyria, and then Judah's next. The Assyrian king tries, doesn't work out, but the Babylonians get him. So Jeremiah is prophesying during the time of probably Josiah, right about that period before they fall and then into their exile. They're going to be taken into captivity. The reason that God lets this happen is that they worship other gods. They break the covenant with God. And so there's a punishment for it. So they're not blameless here. God's not doing something mean. He told them that this would happen if they didn't obey and worship only him. So they're taken away. But Jeremiah, most all the prophets, give a little bit of hope. He's going to look forward to a future time. Okay, fine. You broke that covenant. He likens it to a bride and a husband. You broke it, but there's going to be a new and better covenant. Not like the ones on stone tablets, right? But on the heart of flesh. And so you combine these ideas. Ezekiel 36 is kind of like this too. And when you combine those two, you get this idea that there's going to be a new and better covenant written on our hearts, hearts of flesh, not on stone hearts. And we're going to receive his spirit, which will enable us to fulfill it, to live it out. That's the idea here. Then he finishes the chapter with, well, it wasn't the chapter exactly, but this chapter, 8, 13, when God speaks of a new covenant, it means he has made the first one obsolete. It is out of date and will soon disappear. So I want to spend a little time trying to unconfuse this for a lot of people. We're going to deal with the law today. We're going to talk about the Old Testament law, and you might say, why do we want to talk about that? If it's done away with, well, because the Bible talks a lot about it. Even the New Testament talks a lot about it. And false teachers want to bring people back into it. So, since we are a Bible-believing church, we preach God's Word, not just mine. So, we're going to deal with it today. And I think it's going to help you understand your Bibles a little bit better. Perhaps your faith, this religion, so to speak. But you got to understand covenants. Fancy word for agreement, arrangement, deal. 
So marriage, as I was saying before, is a type of covenant. You have an agreement. Maybe some things in writing. It's a deal that two parties or groups or people make with each other. And if you break it, there are consequences. We call that divorce. So you can look at what happened to Israel like that. They broke the covenant, and it's like a divorce, right? But maybe they're going to get remarried. Now, you probably know about at least two covenants in the Bible, even if you've never read it. You know about the one with Adam and Eve and God, right? You're not supposed to eat the fruit. What do they do? Crunch, they eat it. Break the covenant, sin comes into the world. You probably know about the one with Noah after the flood. Maybe even the rainbow. They get off the ark, and there's a covenant made. I'm not going to do this again, but you have to follow certain rules. It's only like four to seven of them, depending on how you count. But don't break these rules, and I won't flood the earth again. And the rainbow is the sign of that covenant. If we keep going, we get to Abraham, descendant of Shem. Shem, Ham, and Japheth are Noah's sons. And you get the covenant of circumcision. That's the sign of that covenant. We keep going down the line. You get to Moses. Moses is a descendant of Abraham. And you get the law of Moses. The Ten Commandments kind of sparks this covenant. It's all part of it. There's like 613 different laws. Kind of crazy. Right? But the Bible talks a lot about it. There has to be a reason. Now, what a lot of people don't understand it was confusing in the beginning, and it's re-emerging today, is that those laws don't necessarily apply to us. We talked about the Sabbath being one of them, and I said, it's a good idea, so that's why I take one. What other one of the Ten Commandments do you want to break? But there are more laws. It keeps going and going and going, and some of it's totally impossible for us today to follow. But it can be confusing. People will read things in the Old Testament, right? And they'll go, oh no, what's this about pigs? You mean I can't eat bacon? I give up. I don't want to be a Christian anymore. <laughs> no bacon, I'm out. Right? They get confused about things. Maybe you accidentally boiled, I don't know, a baby goat in its mother's milk. No goat. You can't do that. I don't know about that one. There's also mold and mildew remediation specialists in the Old Testament. It's kind of interesting. You better not get mildew you can't re remove from your house in there, or you have to dismantle it. There's all kinds of really strange things in there. Right? Some of them quite practical. It's complicated, but a lot of people, they'll read it and they'll say, well, okay, if this is all God's Word, it must all be totally equal and apply to us, right? No, the law doesn't. They don't understand that. It is a covenant between God and the Israelites. That's what that's about there. So I'm going to try to unconfuse these ideas for you. It's actually understandable that people would get confused if you don't have this understanding, again, of covenants. Really, really important. And it's a re-emerging heresy today. It's kind of surprising. We have something called the Hebrew Roots Movement now. And so I want to guard you guys from that kind of stuff because it's all over the YouTube. And if you look it up, there are people out there, like in Paul's time, trying to confuse you. False teachers. A lot of the New Testament deals with that. So we're dealing with it because the Bible does. And here's how it happens. <clears throat> People aren't guarding themselves with the word. That's really what it is. They don't understand the concept of covenants. And they don't understand that there's a new and better covenant. That's the important thing to understand. They didn't read Hebrews chapter 8. I guess they didn't get there. And they don't understand that even... The old one wasn't between us and God. It's between the Israelites and God. Now, in the early church, it's kind of understandable why this might happen. I've told you this in the past. So we're going to just overview this quickly. At first, Christianity is a Jewish sect. Yes, it came from there. Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. All the early believers are Jews. It takes like 10 chapters of Acts for them to figure it out. Finally, Peter does. He gets that vision. It takes him three times to get the point that the Gentiles are now included. Who are Gentiles? Us, if we're not Jewish. If you're not Jewish, you guys can come on into Christianity too. They're called Christians for the first time in Acts 11. But even after that, it's still 
a sect. It's still seen as a Jewish sect. In fact, the sect of the Nazarenes. Jesus was from Nazareth. So they're calling it this for a long, long time. It's a very Jewish thing. And here's what we have. There's a council in Acts 15, one of the church, first church councils, to decide this. Paul, Barnabas, Titus, they go to the mother church in Jerusalem. No, it is not Rome at that time. It is Jerusalem. James is there. James is Jesus' brother. And so they discuss it. Some people are like, yeah, those Gentiles, they need to get circumcised, and they need to follow the law of Moses in order to get in. Ultimately, it's decided that no, Gentiles don't need to do this. Peter calls it a yoke. A yoke is something you put over two animals' necks to keep them going in the same direction. It's heavy. It's a yoke that not even our fathers or we could bear. Don't put that on the Gentiles. It's not necessary. So they're happy. Yes. So they get a letter and they take it around to all the different churches. Good thing. Later, Paul talks about this in his letter to Galatia, to the Galatians. He brings it up. He talks about this visit. It's pretty important. So I want to give you guys a little bit more homework that you're probably not going to do anyway, but <laughs> read Galatians this week. One through six. Six chapters. It's not really a long book. Now, I've said this in the past, and I've done this. I've said that all you need to refute this teaching about having to follow all these laws and the law of Moses is Galatians. That's all you need. Just read Galatians. If it's not totally obvious to you, you have some reading comprehension problems. It's really, really obvious. This is why the letter is written. You have to know the purpose for why some of these books are written, and then you get everything right. Paul is writing because there are false teachers coming in to that region, to that church in that area, and telling them, you got to get circumcised. you got to follow the law of Moses. So this is what it's all about. Now, I'm not going to have time to read the whole thing this morning, so I'm going to give you an overview of the letter so you can just quickly see it for yourself. We're going to rapid fire some scriptures here, and I want you to see that the point is made very, very clear, and then we'll get to some application. So Paul opens up, and he immediately says that he is an apostle, not of man, not appointed by any person, but of God. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. And this is where he got his message from, from Jesus, not from man. It's not a manly idea. He says, if anybody, even angels, bring you any other gospel except the gospel of Jesus Christ, Jesus plus the law in context, that's what he's going to move to, he's cursed, anathema. You're cursed. Think about that. So he's saying, anybody comes in a false teacher and says anything but Jesus, but the gospel, puts any other yoke on you, that person's cursed. Very serious statement. Right out the gate, he's saying this immediately. Very strong words. He moves into chapter 2. And he's going to be talking about the background behind his original conversion, how he goes to Arabia. So he doesn't go to man first. Again, I didn't go check it out with any, uh, nope, I got it right from Jesus. Spent three years soaking it in. All right, then, he goes and has a talk with Peter, <laughs> hangs out with Peter in Jerusalem. He saw just Peter, James, hangs out for a little while, checks it out. You're good. Fourteen years later, goes back to Jerusalem, and now he's talking about this Acts 15 thing, this council. He brings Barnabas and Titus. He puts Titus in there on purpose. It's kind of interesting. And when you think about it, I was really thinking deeply about this. This is really interesting. Titus is a Gentile. He's a Gentile. He's really important. The book, Titus, he trusts Titus on the island of Crete to do what? To appoint more elders. Basically, like, I would have to trust someone a lot to say, you go somewhere else, <laughs> you go to New York, right? And I want you to go there and you're cool. You can make pastors. You can go there and just, just appoint pastors, right? So he's got to be pretty high up. Paul really trusts him. But Paul makes a note of saying, I didn't have Titus circumcised. That's huge. That's really, really important. And if you're reading Exodus, you know that you have to be circumcised even to celebrate the Passover, which is required by the law. So they're clearly not following the law. Proof positive right there. Then there's a situation with Peter. <laughs> Peter goes to Antioch, and he's behaving like a Gentile. He's hanging out with the non-Jewish people, doing non-Jewish things. 
Maybe things that, according to the law or their rules, are not cool. But then James' friends show up, the Jewish people show up, and then he stops hanging out with the Gentiles. He starts being really, really Jewish. Do we do this kind of thing? Right, we get clicky. So Paul calls him out. And Paul says this. There's going to be some important things in here. Galatians 2, starting at verse 14. When I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws, did you catch that? Have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish traditions? You and I are Jews by birth, not sinners like the Gentiles, yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. He continues to 18, rather, I am a sinner. I am a sinner. If I rebuild the old system of law, I already tore it down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. Keep these things in mind because they're going to tie into our application. Pay close attention. He's a sinner. He's a sinner if he tries to do this. Galatians 2.21 I do not treat the grace of God as meaningless. For if keeping the law could make us right with God, then there was no need for Christ to die. Chapter 3, pretty good one. Oh, you foolish Galatians, he says. Kind of like the get behind me Satan thing we saw last week that Jesus did to Peter. Strong, strong language. You guys are fools. He continues, 3.3. Three. How foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit... Why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Do you see where he's going here? Paul compares being under the law to being enslaved. It's Sarah, Hagar as examples. Galatians 4.12, Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to live as I do in freedom from these things, from the law, for I have become like you Gentiles, free. From those laws. Galatians 5.2. Listen, I, Paul, tell you this. If you are counting on circumcision to make you right with God, then Christ will be of no benefit to you. I'll say it again. If you are trying to find favor with God by being circumcised, you must obey every regulation in the whole law of Moses. For if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. Galatians 5.12, I just wish that those troublemakers, the false teachers I was talking about, who want to mutilate you by circumcision would mutilate themselves. I hope the knife slips. Galatians 6.12, those who are trying to force you to be circumcised want to look good to others. They don't want to be persecuted for teaching that the cross of Christ alone can save and even those who advocate circumcision don't keep the whole law themselves. They only want to be circumcised so that they can boast about it. They can boast about it and claim you as their disciples. That's the point. That's why people, even today, do that. It's about pride. Now, again, two sides of the same coin, this and next week. Right? There is something we do have to do. We're going to talk about that next week. But if you watched my message for next week alone, it might get confusing. It should be observable to others that we are Christians. That's important. Works or good religious behavior is a byproduct of our faith. There should be a response to what Jesus has done for us. Like the last song we sang, beautiful, right? If that's what heaven's like, I'm in. It's beautiful. We should reflect on that. That should permeate, and then good deeds should come out of us as a response to that. It's not that we shouldn't be doing it. It's how. How we should be doing it. That's what's important. We should not be doing it so we can boast about it. Quite the opposite. It should be written on our hearts now, and then just be an outpouring of what we know about Jesus, this love he has for us. We should reflect that. 
So why would anyone want to return to the law of Moses? I'll give you a couple of reasons. Because they don't understand it. They don't get it. They don't get the mold remediation thing. <laughs> they don't get that it's a yoke. It's really hard. They don't get another thing. You got to follow all of it. Read James 2.10. It'll tell you, if you break one of the commands, you broke them all. There's a command in there about killing people when they break commandments. Remember I talked about the Sabbath? Well, natural question after the Ten Commandments. What happens if someone breaks it? Says you got to kill them. That's a command too. So what happens if you don't kill them? You broke the law. Think about it. So if one of these Hebrew roots people tells you, well, you've got to follow the law. Really? Okay. Anyone in your church ever break the Sabbath? Yeah. Are they dead? No. Then you're guilty. You broke the law. That's how it works. They don't understand that. Also, as I alluded to or said, because of pride, when someone says, I have to do all these religious things, and we have other Christian denominations that do that, right? They say, you got to do all this good stuff or you might not get in. You ever hear people say that or do things? You know what they're saying when they say that? Christ is not enough. That's what they're saying. It's Jesus plus something else, plus me. Yeah, I know, Jesus died on the cross, you see, but I'm, I'm also pretty awesome. You know, so I want to show everybody how awesome I am. <laughs> really. <laughs> Think about it, though, when we do that. They want to boast, but Ephesians 2.8, God saved you by his grace when you believed, and you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so none of us can boast about it. Now, again, another quick note. Immediately, we see the other side of the coin. So if you keep reading Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Both. People have a really hard time with both. We'll see the other side of this coin next week. Again, all you need to refute this teaching is Galatians. We saw this last week regarding losing interest in things of the world. Let's look at this verse here again in this light. Galatians 6.14. Paul's writing, As for me, may I never, may I never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in this world has been crucified and this, the world's interest in me has also died. You're not going to be too popular when you preach like Jesus. Matthew 5 through 7. Remember I said to do this homework? You want to read that straight through. The chapter breaks act as interruptions. <laughs> they really do. Matthew 5 through 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. It is one continuous flow of Jesus talking. Don't interrupt him. You must keep reading. <laughs> kind of important because he says some things that confuse people but if you keep reading he unconfuses it for you so it would be like what listening to watching the first you know five minutes of this sermon before I got to my conclusion or my application you might say what are they talking about or drawing the conclusion just from that little period of time like one sentence in a book and saying you know what the story was all about is that how we read our Bibles uh-huh so Matthew 5 through 7, it is one sermon. So he says some things about the law. I didn't come to abolish it. I came to what? Fulfill it. You ever hear of a fulfillment company? What do they do? They package your goods. They send it out. It's done. It's finished. It's fulfilled. Oh, but what about that? Not, well, heaven and earth passing away thing. Yeah, it's called an idiom. But keep reading your Bible. Galatians is going to clarify what Jesus said. It's the whole thing. In it and in this context, he says this, Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. 
Most people stop there and say, ooh, i got to get out there and show everyone what I'm doing. All my good works. Look at me, right? Yeah. Keep reading. Matthew 5 says, yeah, you're a light. You're supposed to go out there and do great things, but then he tells you how to do it. Matthew 6, 1, watch out. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired by others, for you will lose your reward from your Father in heaven. When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and the streets to call attention to their acts of charity. Exclamation point. I tell you the truth. They have received all the reward they will ever get. But when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give your gifts in private, and your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Hmm. Keep reading. Have you ever heard the phrase, idle hands make the devil's work? It's one of those incomplete, catchy phrases we've been talking about lately. It's kind of like half right. While the devil gets us when we're alone, he likes that, he actually also, depending on who we are, likes to keep us busy. The devil loves busy work, especially in ministry. Absolutely loves it. When we are doing busy work, we aren't praying. We aren't in the Word. We aren't developing our relationship with God. And the devil loves that, loves it. The devil doesn't want us taking time to just sit and listen, pray, stop, be with him. He doesn't want us praying. He wants us playing God. That's what the devil wants. But we need to do more praying and less playing the world trains us to be human doings, but we are human beings. It's about being with God. The devil also loves busy work because it's often fueling our pride, right? Feeling pretty good about what we did. He wants us to work instead of worship. Now, the two, they're not mutually exclusive. We're going to see that again next week. We'll take a look at that too. But sometimes the ministry becomes the idol. You ever see this happen in church? We worship the worship sometimes. Sometimes it's more about letting everybody know what you're doing, posting on social media. Do we do that all the time? Look at me. Look at what my right hand is doing. Or telling the whole world about it instead of Jesus. That's it. Leonard Ravenhill, you think I'm tough, listen to him, said, No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. The pulpit can be a shop window to display one's talents. The prayer closet allows no showing off. Prayer helps us greatly with our pride. So we do things like the law, so we can play God. It's about our pride. Again, from last week, we are not the heroes of this story. It's about Jesus. Jesus is the great high priest and perfect sacrifice. It gets no better than that. The toy... It's just a copy of the real superhero we have in Jesus. When you grow up, you don't need show and tell anymore. You mature in the faith, in relationship. You have the real deal, and you're content to boast in him. You get up for show and tell, and there's no toy in your hand. Let me tell you about Jesus. That's it. Almost every Sunday, I don't want to lie to you guys, almost every Sunday, I get invited 
to show and tell <laughs> by my favorite two-year-old, Benjamin. He's two, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter who I'm talking to, any one of you. He doesn't care. He's like the persistent widow, is that in Luke 18? <laughs> she gets what she wants because she's really persistent. He'll come right up to me, and it's show and tell time, sometimes with his guitar, his little toy guitar. He's good at it. And he'll come up to me, and he doesn't care if we're in the middle of a conversation. He's like, let's go. And he reaches out, and he grabs my finger. That's how little he is. <laughs> and he takes me to a back room we have in the church, as if I don't know where that is. And so he brings me back there. <laughs> to show me my guitars, right? So there's guitars back there on the wall. So it's like a room for the worship team. They call it like a green room if you've ever done like any kind of show business stuff. And there are guitars back there. They can hang out, pray, get away from you guys while they concentrate. <laughs> Maybe they're going to practice a little bit. And he takes me back there. It's a cool room. And he shows me the guitars. And so we go through the colors and stuff like that. He strums them. It's okay. It's kind of fun. Right? So he's showing me all these things. It's interesting to learn from Benjamin. Very interesting. He's got the toy, right? What does he want? He wants a real thing. That's what he's looking forward to. Right? So he knows. This is good for now. It's all good. I think you've had to drive places to go back and get it when he forgot it. He shows everybody the guitar. So <clears throat> he loves it now. It's okay. It's good for now. But that... That's what I'm looking forward to. Imagine if Benjamin matured. He grew up, and he still asked, still held on to the replica, the copy of the good thing that was to come. Look well, kind of crazy. He's looking forward to the real deal, not the replica. Comes in with his toy, but he's that. The one, he wants the white one. He's pretty persistent. He's probably going to end up with it. I'm telling you. Watch. That's going to happen. <laughs> Testimony, like 20 years from now. <laughs> but that's what he's looking forward to. So I hope that when Benjamin grows up, he'll graduate to the one on the wall. That's the hope for him. Correct? Also, if he learns how to play, he's real good. He's not going to need to boast about it. It'll be evident that he's really good. He won't need to let his left hand know what his right hand is doing, right? It'll speak for its, itself. He'll fulfill the proverb, 27.2, let someone else praise you, not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. Galatians 3.23, before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way. The law was our guardian, pedagogue, like a babysitter, someone who looked after the kids, took them to school, until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our pedagogue, babysitter, guardian. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 6, remember that? Let us mature in the faith. Let's move on in the faith, into maturity, into Christ Jesus. Again, as we see in Hebrews 8, the old things, this is the point, the old things are just a copy, a shadow of what is to come in Jesus Christ. And so it is with everything in our lives. Everything. We're looking forward to one thing, Jesus. That's it. In heaven. Hebrews teaches us that Jesus is superior to everything in the old and in our lives. When you try to return to it, or to the things of the world if you've come to faith. You're saying that Jesus is not enough, but Jesus is enough. He is all we need. He is the great high priest and perfect sacrifice. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus 
the great shepherd of the sheep, and ratified an eternal covenant with his blood, may he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you, through the power of Jesus Christ, every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen.